I'm really sorry for being late. Can you hear me okay? I can't shout, I've got really sore throat. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'm really sorry for being late. I was at a meeting with my own university on uh, uh, something like Skype and uh, it went over time and I'm really sorry. Okay, so are you all midwifery students? Yes. Yes? Yeah, all, mid all midwifery. Okay, and which years? First. Your first years. Okay, brilliant. Right, well, where I teach at the University of Greenwich, um, in our part of the faculty, it's mainly nurses and midwives, and the little bay I sit in at work, it's all midwives. So I'm constantly surrounded by midwives all the time. Um, we had our new intake of first year students, and there were 305. I'm not sure how many midwifery, I've got to guess, maybe about 50 out of 305 students are midwifery. So they do a lot of their studies together, nurses and midwives, and then midwifery specific. Yeah, okay. So this is what we're going to be looking at. And as midwives, you know better than anyone that if people don't have sex, they're not going to have babies, <laughs> unless it's IVF. But some of the, di some of the difficulties, uh, what I hear from some midwives is, yes, they're fine about talking about conception and pregnancy and birth, but they don't like talking about other things about sex. And even when it comes to talking about contraception, because in the UK we have had problems with unplanned and teenage pregnancies. And the midwife might think, oh, this person just had a baby, she doesn't want to talk about contraception now, but if the midwife doesn't talk about it, then the health visitor doesn't, then the GP doesn't, nobody talks about it. And nine months later, there's another mouth to feed. Okay, so this is what we're going to talk about. I don't mind you stopping me at any point. If you want to challenge me or question me, just stop me whenever you want to, okay? And if you tweet, please tweet, all right? <laughs> yeah, okay. So, have you heard of the expression that there's no health without mental health? Have you heard that at all? Some of you have? It's a big World Health Organization expression where lots of people say, well, there's no health without mental health. We've got to remember, we're not just physical beings, we're mental beings as well. But I would argue that there's no health without sexual health as well. So it's important for us to address that. Now, you. your whole week here is on language and communication, and I'd say it's very difficult for us to use any language without talking about sex. All right? So even though the whole university wants to talk about language and communication, I'd like to say, well, sex could be that language and communication. <laughs> All right. So it's really good for you to start off thinking yourselves, um, especially something like sexual health. So what do you consider to be sexual health? <coughs> so if I ask you, what does sexual health mean to you? What is it? That you have it and you like it. Right, you have it and you like it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's really, really important. Yeah, okay. Okay. What else? So sexual health. If somebody says to you, what, 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 what did you do this afternoon? And you say, I went to do a session on sexual health. What's that? Normal. Is what? Normal. Normal, okay. So, and what do you mean by normal? <laughs> <laughs> Say it in Dutch if you want to. Carl, will you? Uh, um, everyone does it. Okay. So what? Well, everyone does sex. Everyone does sex? So every, everyone has the sexual health? Yeah? See, because not everyone has sex. So that's the thing. Supposing someone isn't having sex for whatever reason. Supposing they're not. Are they still sexually healthy? Can you say they've got the sexual health if they're not having sex? What do you think? Hmm. Yeah, it, yes. <laughs> it, yes, it depends on it depends on the it depends on the individuals. Because you may find, well look, so maybe some or all of you have sex, but you're not having it at the moment. You're sitting here talking about it. So, 
Or then you might say, oh yes, but I only have sex with my partner and my partner's not here at the moment. So there are lots of reasons why people don't have sex. Or maybe they're traveling, maybe they're in prison, maybe they're sick and in hospital. Maybe they're pregnant and having a baby, and that's the last thing she wants to think about doing it. You know, it's because of sex that I'm in this position. So she may not, you know, so lots of people may not be having sex, but that's, they can still be sexually healthy. So it's really good, we'll explore what this means then. What is sexual health? That's important. The next one, so how do you think it relates to your clients? Well, as midwives, it really relates well, doesn't it? So how does sexual health relate to your clients? Even when you said having it and enjoying it, supposing people, some people don't enjoy it, or supposing some people are doing it because they're forced into it, or raped, abused, or supposing some people do it because they think, it's my duty. You know, some people from their cultures and their religions, um, especially in cultures that seem to be patriarchal, where men rule over the whole thinking of the community, it may be that they think this is our duty just to reproduce. And that enjoyment doesn't even come into it. I'm here to have babies. You know? So there are lots of different ways of thinking about this. So the more you explore this, the more you think about it, then see how it relates to the services you provide. Think about the people that you're working with. Because it could be, someone might say, let me give you a good example here. In some cultures, it's really important for families to be very big. So some parts of the world, they need really big families. So supposing there's a family living here now, in your local town, they're here, but they've come from another part of the world. And you go to visit them as the midwife. You go to visit the woman, and maybe she's just had her 12th child. Now that's a lot. So maybe you all talk to each other about, I'm visiting a woman that's just had 12 children. Because that doesn't seem normal, it doesn't seem usual, does it? 12, it's a lot. So you might say, oh, I'm going to visit this woman now, and she's had 12 children. And you go to her house, and maybe you're checking for postnatal depression. And you're asking her about postnatal depression. And she might say, no, I'm not depressed at all. Because maybe in her language or her culture, they don't even talk of depression. And she might say, no, I'm not depressed. But actually, I feel worn out all the time. And I find that I cry a lot. But no, I'm not depressed. Because depression might be a Western concept. But then she's talking to you about signs and symptoms that shows, yes, she is depressed. And then someone might say, if she says, oh, look, I'm worn out all the time. I'm looking after these 12 children. My husband doesn't help. I have to look after these. And look at the way people will try to minimize this. They like, oh, don't worry. When they grow up, they'll all look after you. You won't have to do a thing because you've got a big family to look after you. But that's not acknowledging how she feels now. She might be worn out. And if somebody says to her, well, 12, you know, that is a lot. You know, didn't you think of contraception? And she might say, no. In my religion, I can't use contraception. And if my husband wants a bigger family. In fact, there's some parts of Nigeria and Ghana where if a woman has more than 12 children, there's a special honorary title for her because it's such a wonderful thing to have such a huge family. But when you ask her more, she might say, actually, I didn't want any of my children. My husband is cruel to me, and he's a very, very jealous man. And if I go outside into the street, he's jealous that other men will look at me. So he keeps me pregnant all the time, so I can't go out. So you don't know. Until you ask, you don't know. So that's why it's important why I say mental health and sexual health really important to try to understand that. Does that make sense? Am I talking okay? Yeah? All right, great. Okay, so next time you go and work on, on, on a maternity unit, start thinking of some of these things. Also, somebody said this morning, because I was talking about sex this morning, somebody said that this is like breaking taboos. Yeah? Just the very fact of talking about it. 
Well, when I was a student nurse and I worked in obstetrics, so I was the first male from my hospital. And when I went to the obstetric hospital, I was given a list of 10 things that men cannot do. And the teacher was quite religious and she said, there, you know, she didn't, obviously didn't want men there. And she gave me this list of things telling me what I shouldn't do. So I couldn't remove sutures after an episiotomy. Or if a woman was breastfeeding, if she wanted the curtains closed, that was a sign that she didn't want the, a man there. And I wasn't allowed to express a woman for breastfeeding. So I've given this list of 10 things. And I had to do two weeks on night duty. And there was just one midwife, she went on one ward, and one student, and the student went on the other ward. And I had to wake all the women up, six o'clock in the morning, screaming babies, and this woman had given birth the night before, didn't know how to breastfeed. The baby's screaming, she's agitated, so I'm trying to say to her, you know, just express your nipple, do this, do this, and hold the baby's face and put it on. And all the other women were shouting, go on, do it for her. I wasn't allowed to touch. But all the other women were telling me to, so I did. I expressed her, I put the baby on, and it worked beautifully. And about a week later, this uh, um, uh, education, the, the teacher, she came up to me, very severe looking face, and she said, we hear you expressed a woman last week. And I said, yes. And all of a sudden she smiled and she said, well, congratulations, it worked very well. From now on, the male, male students can do it as long as the women don't mind. Okay, so breaking taboos, especially this stuff about sexual health, you will be breaking taboos. Can you think of any others? Have you come across any? Or anything that's difficult to talk about? Yes. Um, um, I work as a midwife and uh, after 10 days we visit at home and then we talk about uh, sex yeah. uh, with a male, uh, no. uh, with a husband. Yeah. It's a little bit, it's not so easy to okay. uh, talk about, you tell them that you uh, are going to do it when you uh, like it. Yeah. Both. Yeah. yeah. But it's, the people are cool. Uh, yeah. So where does the difficulty come from? You or the person or the culture between you? Uh, I work in a very religious uh, yeah, uh -huh. area. So I yeah. think they, yeah, it's, they, uh, they, they don't they expect. expect it. Yeah. Right, they don't expect it. Okay. Now, I told a group yesterday, there's a really good book for education lists and they use an abbreviation in there. And that abbreviation is four letters. K a S H. So the K stands for knowledge. So what knowledge? So you're going in with knowledge thinking, right, I need to talk about sex. Or well, those be 10 days afterwards, and you may not really feel like it now. I need to talk about it, and maybe even mention contraception. I need to do it. So knowledge. But then there's the attitudes. So if you go in, um, if you went into this particular area of, oh, it's quite religious, they won't want to talk about this, so I won't unless they tell me first. So your attitudes could be closed towards it. Okay, that's important. But also the skills. So what skills have you got? So if you start talking to them and say, look, I need to talk to you about sex. And suppose she says, oh, I don't want to hear about that at the minute. It was that that got me into this trouble in the first place. Right, so what skills have you got? If she says no, do you just, oh, okay, well, that's it then. But supposing she's vulnerable now to becoming pregnant again and needs to talk contraception. So what skills have you got to negotiate those difficult situations? And the H stands for habit. How much of a habit do you do of it? So if you did it to every single one, it would become so, so easy for you. Okay? If you think, oh no, I'll only mention it occasionally, then it's going to be hard. Maybe your attitude, you might feel nervous or shy or embarrassed, or you think you don't know what you're going to talk about. That's your attitudes. But the more you do it, the more of a habit you make, the greater skills you will get, especially when people, maybe some people are hostile towards you. Maybe some people think it's none of your business. So you develop the skills the more you do it. Does that make sense? Is it okay? Yeah? Okay, right. So that's important. And if you think, right, well, we need to practice this more, tell your teachers here. Okay? So it should be in your curriculum more and more and more. So keep 
giving the feedback to your teachers. Look, if you want us to talk about sex 10 days afterwards, give us the skills how to do it. What are we meant to talk about? If we're meant to talk to them about contraception, how much do we know about contraception? Okay, so keep telling your teachers. They want to hear, I promise you. I haven't told them yet, but they do. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Look, people in Belgium get naked, okay? So sex is important in Belgium. <laughs> okay, and another thing, even, even when you said the word normal, so we have to challenge that word normal. Because what's the opposite of normal? Abnormal. Abnormal, yeah. So if, if you say to a person, oh, that's normal. So even when you're talking, if you go and talk about sex, so you're talking to a patient or to a client about sex, and say, well, look, some people will probably start having sex within a few weeks after having a baby. And that's normal. But supposing she says to you, oh, well, look, my sister has had a baby three months ago, and she's still not having sex yet. So be careful with the word normal. Because if you say, well, that's normal, are you implying that something else is abnormal? Okay? Because you don't know why the sister doesn't want sex for three months afterwards. So it's worth finding all that out. So don't try to pigeonhole people. Oh, right, all men are like this and all women are like that. No, we're all different. But is it better okay? to talk with them? Woman alone or with a couple? Well, there you go. That's the type of thing that you need to sort of think about and work out. Because, yet, yeah, supposing it's an abusive relationship, it could be, if, if he's abusing her, mm -hmm. then she might need to time with you alone. But also, look at it from the other point of view. Look how many men say, oh, well, since my wife has had the baby, she doesn't want me anywhere near her. She only talks to the midwife. No one tells me what's happening. So he may feel quite alienated and left out. So that's a, that's a judgment call. But there, that's something worth exploring even more. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, because he might be thinking, oh, well, you know, she's had the baby now. She should be ready for sex. And then look how many women think, I don't feel ready, but if I don't have sex now, he might go off with somebody else. So then she's worried and she's stressed. And the more she's stressed, the more anxious she becomes. So then that's impacting on her sex. She's not going to enjoy it if she's, oh, God, I've got to do this in case he runs off. And you said sex was enjoyment. Now she's not enjoying it. Okay? So, yeah, really, really important there. There is no one simple truth. And that's why, so even when you're thinking of people, the difference in everyone, there's no one simple truth. Every single one of us in the room are sexual beings. But we've got our own ideas, our feelings, our likes, our differences. Okay? Now, I wanted to show you this one because um, when I did my doctorate a few years ago, I went all around England asking nurses and midwives what they did on sexual health education as students. So just as you're doing now, I was asking them what they did. And this is one story I'll never forget. One of the nurses said that in three years of her nursing degree, they did nothing on sex or sexual health at all. Nothing. And then all of a sudden, she said, oh, I remember one thing. She said, the sister tutor, the, 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 the teacher that she had, told us that if ever we were going to give a young man a bed bath, and if we pulled back the sheets and he had an erection, just flick it with your pencil. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember that one. But she said, that's the only thing they ever did in three years. And in fact, when I was a student nurse, we only ever had one session in three years. Uh, we had one session and that was on sexual infections. And the tutor was showing us slides, and they were all horrible, Ugh, and it was right after lunch. It was horrible things. <laughs> but she was really cool and calm and collected with it. Saying, oh, this is syphilis, this is gonorrhea, whatever, it didn't matter to her at all. And then all of a sudden, one photograph showed a man's hands like that. And he had second stage syphilis, so a rash over his hands. 
And she just looked at the hands and she, oh my goodness, look at his dirty fingernails. <laughs> and that was the only thing that bothered her. The, 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 the vaginas and the penises with all the drippy bits didn't bother her, but the dirty fingernails did. <laughs> okay, and even when you're talking about sexuality, so what do you understand by the word sexuality? If somebody says, oh, your sexuality, what does that mean to you? Go on, anyone? <laughs> What's a person se saying? Having sex. Not so much having sex, but who you are. So your sexuality... So you, you might see lots of rainbow flags around the place. What's the rainbow flag mean? Yeah? So lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. And that list seems to be getting longer and longer and longer, doesn't it? You know? Sometimes there's a queue on there. Now, does the cue mean that somebody's quest questioning their sexuality? Or does it mean queer? Or then you might see an I, which could be intersex. That's someone born with the genitals of both genders. Or, so the list is getting longer. But like I showed you that picture of the black and white male and female, so we mustn't think about sexuality like this. Don't think, well, oh, there are heterosexuals, and then there's all the others. Because if we do that, it's comparing a them and us. It's like male, female, black, white, young, old, whatever. So we must move away from these, these two ways of thinking. Okay? So when you're thinking about sexuality, if somebody says, oh, my sexuality is, think of at least these four uh, perspectives on it. So the first one is the orientation. So that, that literally means the way a person is. So if somebody says, well, I'm straight, I'm heterosexual, or I'm lesbian, or I'm gay, that's your orientation, okay? It's not as if you woke up one morning and thought, oh, well, I was born as a heterosexual, and I think now I'm going to become a lesbian. It just doesn't happen like that, okay? You are who you are. That's what orientation means. But that may not be the same as the, <coughs> the identity or the label that you use. So supposing, you're, supposing you go to do a home visit, and the home visit may be to a couple from a different part of the world, where in their part of the world, the culture is, every man and every woman must get married. You must do it. And then as soon as you're married, your parents will want you to start having babies, because that's the thing you do. That's what's normal. That's what's seen as normal in that society. So you must get married and must have babies. But supposing the man is thinking to himself, well, actually, I'm gay. I fancy other men. I don't fancy women. But I've got to get married because that's what my culture or my religion tells me I must do. And I must start making babies because that's what my culture and religion tells me to do. So if you look at him and think, oh, he's a married man and he's got children, you think his identity, he's heterosexual, he's straight. But actually, he may not be. So the identity doesn't always match up with the label. And in that case, neither did the attractions. So you might think, well, look, I'm married to a woman to have babies by her, because that's what my culture and my religion expect. But actually, my attractions, I'm attracted to people of the same gender as me. And his behaviours. So supposing that you go to do the postnatal visit, so it's ten days after, and you start talking to her about, about sex, and when she's going to start having. And all of a sudden she breaks down crying and she says, I think he's seen somebody else. He's gone off me, he doesn't want me anyway. He's starting to see somebody else. And then all of a sudden you find out that the somebody else is other men. Okay? So what's going on here then is a person's orientation isn't necessarily the same as the label that they use, nor with their attractions, nor their behaviours. Okay? And that's why it's really important to think about it. Because if it's, if it's just as I've given you that example now, then supposing he's going out, but if you said to him, well, if you're having sex with other men, you're gay, he might say, no, I'm not. I'm straight, I've got a wife. Because in some parts of the world, you'll be beheaded, or killed, or, or put in prison, if you come out as being gay. So it might be very important for him to say this, that he's straight, but his behaviours are different to that. 
Okay? Now, what happens if he's then going out? So he says, well, I can't go out. So his practice is what he does. So he might think, well, I can't go into a gay bar because people will label me as being gay. So where can I have sex? So he may be having sex in public spaces, maybe in parks, cruising grounds, saunas, that type of thing, where people won't see him and say, oh, that man is gay. But in that case, if he's having that sort of casual sex, and if there's not much time even to talk about, shall we use condoms, shall we pr practice safer sex, then he may be putting himself at risk. And if he's putting himself at risk, how can he then go back home to his wife and start talking about condoms with her. Because they haven't used condoms, that's how he's just had a baby. So, do you see what I mean? There's a lot of this here. So when you're thinking of sexuality, consider at least those four things, I'd say. Is there anything you want to say? Or any questions? No, you're okay? All right for me to talk at you a bit more? Yeah, okay, great. Now, this one of a filing cabinet, the reason why I want to show this, do you know what the word stigma means? Yeah, stigma. So basically, it's, it's a Greek word that means a mark or a sign. So I said to this morning's group, the mark is, I'm wearing glasses. That's a mark or a sign. But now when we use the term stigma, especially in healthcare, it often means something that's discrediting, something that's not too good. So if people are discriminated against because of a mark or a sign, so when you look at the colour of our skin, for example, different colour with different people's skin, that's a mark or a sign. Now, we can't hide that. But you may be hiding something else about you. So when I showed you that last slide about sexual orientation, it may be someone thinks, oh, I know what my orientation is, but I didn't tell anybody else because they might think this is bad. So they're concealing it. But the difficulty is then, when does somebody come out about it? And what we need to ask ourselves, what are they coming out of and what are they coming out into? Because it could be, supposing they've been brought up in a family that's very religious and says, right, you only ever have sex when you get married. And even when you get married and you have sex, you should only be doing it for having babies. That's very, very strict. Okay? But supposing that person thinks, well, actually, I've had loads of sex with loads of people. <coughs> but I can't come out to my family about that because they would think bad of me. So the bottom drawer here is about stuff that's hidden. And in the UK, one of the things that's often hidden is around abortion. So abortion is what's called legally permissible. So that doesn't mean it's legal. A woman can't go to a service and say, right, I want an abortion, please. It's, it's not legal like that. But if she goes to two medical practitioners with certain conditions, then the two medical practitioners can sign the form to say, right, it's legally permitted to have an abortion now. And by the time a woman reaches the age of 40 in the UK, one in three women will have had at least one abortion. Okay, so one in every three. But not one in three talk about it. So especially from the midwifery point of view, supposing a woman has had an abortion, and maybe she's concealed, she doesn't want to talk about it. And then you meet her, she comes in now, she's pregnant, and you ask, oh, is this the first time you've been pregnant? No, it isn't. But if, if she's, oh no, I was pregnant before. Oh, what did you have, a boy or a girl? Right, that's really making it awkward. How is she going to express this now? And what are you going to think of her if she says, well, actually, I've had an abortion? So she might be, her, she might be nervous of telling you in case you stigmatise and judge her. Okay? So this one, the reason why I want to show the bottom draw, a friend of mine, a nurse friend, she did her PhD in psychological impact of abortion. And when I read her thesis... One of the women said she thinks of her abortion as her bottom drawer. She said the top drawer, that's what you open and you show to everyone. This is what the whole world sees of you. The middle drawer is a little bit more private. That's just for your loved ones. But the bottom drawer, that's the stuff you don't show to anyone. Now as midwives, you may be coming across people 
who've had abortions. And it's really interesting to find out why. Because you don't know. I'll give you one quick example. I know the time is running on. I'll give you one example. One of my students went to visit a sexual health service. And she had to write, her assignment was to write a reflection on the visit. And the first step, she said, I went to a sexual health service and an 18-year-old woman came in and uh, the nurse asked her why she was there and the woman said, I need an abortion, please. So step two of the reflection is, is what were your feelings, your guts? What did you feel? And my student said, oh, bless, she's 18. I wonder why she needs this. So she was feeling empathy, maybe even sympathy towards it. Oh, she's 18. Why does she need an abortion? And then step three says, what do you notice about yourself or others? And she said, well, the nurse was so expert at getting this young woman to open up and to tell her story that the young woman said this was her fourth abortion in two years. So my student said her feelings completely changed. She said, haven't you heard of contraception? You know, why, why didn't you use condoms? She said she completely changed towards her. But then the next step says, and what else happened? And she said, well, the nurse was so expert at drawing out the story, the young woman said, well, I'm 18 now, but I was married when I was 15. I was married in Pakistan, and my husband was 64 at the time. And he's abusive towards me. And he brought me to the UK, and he's desperate to have a boy child by me. And he's abusive all the time. And she said, the only thing I've ever heard about contraception is something called the pill. But if my husband found the pill in my flat, he would murder me. So she said, so every time I get pregnant, I thought all I could do is have an abortion. And she said, so I've been to four different hospitals, so nobody would have follow-on notes so that somebody would pick this up. But it was the expertise of that knowledge, attitude, skills, and habits. Because she was expert at asking these questions, that's what drew it out. Okay? So the bottom drawers that... Listen. Don't just listen to the words, listen to their body language, listen to their facial reactions. If you say something, if you ask a question, oh, is this the first time you've been pregnant? Don't just listen. Don't be sitting there taking notes, look up. Watch what they really say to you, okay? And it may be important for you to say, look, I'm not here to judge anyone. If there's something you want to say to me, and it's in confidence between us, if there's something you want to say, feel free. Okay? You've given them permission to talk. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah? Okay. So, on this slide, it's going to show the ways in which sexual health and mental health are often linked together in so many ways. So, even when we talk about sexual health, you, as midwives, you want to care for your clients holistically, don't you? As whole people. So how can you care for them holistically if you don't address their sexual health? It would be like someone who's a physical nurse who may be fantastic at bandaging wounds, but if the person's having a psychiatric breakdown, you don't know how to talk to them. So holistic means we treat people um, uh, all together. But also, when people have certain mental health problems, that can have a negative <coughs> impact on their sexual well-being as well. Because it could be, supposing someone has um, bipolar, yeah, you know what that, yeah, okay. So, when they're really manic, they want to go out and have sex with dozens and dozens and dozens of people. And then, as soon as they become depressed, they're sitting with, oh my God, how many people did I have sex with? Could I now have infections? Might I be pregnant? All these worries and concerns. So sexual health and mental health really impact on each other there. But also, it could be, if someone is on psychiatric medication, if it's a woman, so some women on psychiatric medication, that doesn't work well with some contraception. So she may be on a certain type of contraception, and if the psychiatrist doesn't know, and then starts her on antipsychotics, for example, then it could mean that her contraception's not going to work. And all of a sudden she becomes pregnant, and thought, well, I didn't think I could, because I was using contraception. So it's important for mental health and sexual health people to talk together. But also with depression as well. Or what about low self-esteem? 
Have you cared for people who really feel poor about themselves? Low self-esteem. Have you come across that? Yeah, any examples? No? Okay, well let me tell you one. I worked with a young woman once, and she'd been born with cleft, cleft lip and palate. Yeah, a cleft lip and palate. But when she was a little girl in school, the stigma of this, the other children called her nasty names. You know what children can be like. They called her nasty names as a little girl. And it so scarred her mentally, it scarred her so badly, that when I worked with her, she grew her hair, but she kept the fringe over her face. So as she's talking to you, you don't see the scar on this side of her face. And she asked me how a boy would put a condom on. She said, supposing I ever have a boyfriend and we go to have sex, how does he use a condom? So I did a condom demonstration, just like I did this morning. I did a condom demonstration. And all of a sudden, she looked at me like that and she said, Dave, with a face like mine, no one ever wants to shag me anyway. That was her doing. She felt so poor about herself. Now, low self-esteem, it's later on these slides, if someone's got low self-esteem, on the one hand, they don't give a damn. Oh, do whatever you like to me. I don't care. Now, that's a problem. The second thing is, they're desperate to be loved. They're desperate for love and affection. And the third problem is, they will be frightened of being rejected. So, supposing she had gone out there. Now, that was a real story, but I'm going to make this bit up. Supposing she's a student here at this university, and this weekend there's going to be a big party. And she thinks, right, I've got to have sex this week. I've never had sex before. It's going to happen this weekend. Maybe she hasn't even kissed anyone. And she, it's going to happen this weekend. So she goes to your local bar. And maybe everyone in there is ugly. But even when the lights go down. And you've had a few pints. And the bar is going to close. Even ugly people aren't that ugly, she might think. So say, say she starts chatting to someone. And they start kissing, and you say that sex is going to happen. So she might say, well, look, I only ever have sex with condoms. Now, supposing he uses one of the excuses that the boys and the men often use. Oh, I can't wear them. They're too tight. They don't fit. I'm allergic to rubber. If she's got low self-esteem, she's more likely to say, oh, go on then on this occasion because she's desperate for the love and attention and she's frightened of being rejected. But if she has unsafe sex tonight, then why should she insist on condoms tomorrow? She might think, oh well, if I put myself at risk tonight, I might as well carry on being at risk. So low self-esteem is a real big difficulty here. Now go back to the woman you're talking about, you go and talk to someone 10 days after, and supposing she says to you, well actually, there's no point in me talking about sex. My husband hasn't come anywhere near me for nine months. And I'm sure he's seeing somebody else. Now, her self-esteem may be rock bottom. So that's really important then. Because supposing he then starts getting abusive towards her, she might think, well, at least I'm getting affection. That's poor mental health. Okay? So can you see the link I'm trying to make here? Is that making sense? Yeah? Yeah, and here then, look, prejudice, stigma, discrimination. So, have you heard the word slut? Do you know what the word slut means? Right, somebody mentioned it the other day, so I thought, you do understand what the word is. Okay, so a slut. But look how that word is often used towards women, but not men. So, if a young boy comes home from school at 16 and says, Hey, Dad, I've had sex for the first time. Then I'm being very stereotypical here. Some dads may say, well, good for you, son, you know, you're a man now. If he's got a twin sister and she comes home and says, Dad, I've had sex for the first time. You little slut. You're grounded for a month. So gender, ge gender differences are really important as well. And that's where the stigma comes in. Is that okay? <laughs> Maybe some of your parents said that because I saw a lot of smiles there. <laughs> right, I just want to show you this bit. Okay, whenever we're talking about sexual health, if I, if I go to students, um, midwifery students, if I say, right, we're going to do a session on sexual health, 
what they often think of is this stuff. Oh, we're going to talk about contraception, or sexual infections, or HIV. So the minute you mention sexual health, some people think, oh, it's all about this. Okay? So it's those things. <coughs> but also, a lot of those have got stigmas, <coughs> stigmas attached to them. But look at this, look at the middle panel there. Now that one. You say you care for your clients holistically. So I would say that holistic model is built up of at least four areas. The first one is the somatic, that, that word is soma, soma so physical, okay? So you may be fantastic, if, if you've got your nursing colleagues, they may be fantastic at looking after physical health and well-being. But the psyche is <coughs> equally important. It could be somebody comes into hospital with a broken leg and that's the least of their problems because by having a broken leg they might now be out of work, they may not have money, they can't afford their flat, all of these things. So they may be more psychologically traumatised than the broken leg. Okay? So that will be somatopsychic or it may be psychosomatic. Yeah? Sometimes people have psychological worries and those worries are so bad, it stops them even going out to meet other people. <coughs> <coughs> this next area, the word pneuma, have you heard of the word pneumothorax? Do you know what a pneumothorax is? It's if the ch chest collapses and there's wind in there, yeah? Or if you see roads being dug up with those big drills, yeah? That's a pneumatic drip, so the word pneuma. Pneumatic drill, pneumothorax, wind in the chest. But in some ancient religions, the word pneuma meant a person's life breath. So even when somebody was dying, when they went <sighs> for their last breath, that's when they were considered to have died. They've breathed out their pneuma. Now, whether you want to call that a person's religion, or their spirituality, or their life beliefs, whatever you want to call it, but for each of us, we may have some really personal beliefs. There's more than our psyche and more than our body. Okay? So that bit of it. And then the final bit, these are three Greek words here used for love, um, love and sex. So the word caritas, charity. You know if you give money into charity boxes? Caritas. It's because right, the, whole, the whole world is our family, so we want to love our family. That's caritas. Um, the word philia means fret, so think of words with philia in. But hemophilia? Bit of hemophilia. What about Philadelphia? <laughs> okay, right? That means brotherly love. Okay? Um, so there are lots of words with that in, but this word in the middle, eros, is where we get the word erotic from. So you might say, well, actually, I love my best friend, but that doesn't mean I want to have sex with my best friend. Okay? So it's different types of love. So what I'm saying there is when we talk about holistic care, think about somebody from at least these four dimensions. Because in the final bit of it, looking there, look how there are so many other conditions in life that can have an impact on sexual health. The quickest example I, I can give you, say, say type 1 diabetes. Do you know people with type 1 diabetes? Yeah, right. So for every man who has type 1 diabetes, one in two men will have problems with erections, erectile dysfunction. Now, you may be the diabetic nurse, and you may say to a person, oh, this is how you test your blood, this is the, the diet you eat, this is the exercise. You may be fantastic at that, but if you don't say to every single man, look, one in two men get problems with erections, how is that bothering you at the moment? If you don't acknowledge it, you've completely wiped it out. Okay? So it's really, really important uh, to mention sexual health. And that's just one example I've given. Look, there are loads on here. Even when you talk, so you've got um, uh, lots of refugees and victims of war living here in Belgium. And I went to a conference a few years ago, and they said for people who have been in war torn countries, a minimum of 50% have been raped, sexually abused, or they've witnessed it in others. 
So if you're going to visit refuge, <coughs> refugees, keep that in mind. At least 50% of them might have been sexually abused. Then even when it comes to doing midwifery exams, uh, examinations on people, you think you're going to do a vaginal examination, and all of a sudden the woman's really uptight about it and nervous. Why is that? What's gone on? Okay? So it could be <coughs> post-traumatic stress disorder. It could be she's already been abused. And again, the stigmas. But that, that can seem a bit negative, so here's the positive. Even if we ended on this one now, look at the positive benefits of sex. Just have a look at that for a moment. <coughs> <coughs> oh, I can see a midwifery one immediately, look. Strengthens pelvic floor, okay? Improved self-esteem, better sleep, better mood, you know? So all of those things that are positive, yeah, okay? That are positive benefits with sex. So don't think, oh, sexual health means talking of unplanned pregnancies, uh, sexual infections, think of the positive stuff as well. And here's a few on here, look. And this one, particularly important, promoting the joys and the pleasures of sex. Because how many people say, especially women, in, in, in cultures, especially patriarchal cultures, they think, oh no, the woman lies on the bottom, the man lies on the top, and that's how you make the babies. And it's not about her enjoyment, it's about whether you're going to be making the babies and carry on the family line. But sex is meant to be joyful and pleasurable. What about women who have been um, cut, female genital cutting or female genital mutilation? If that's happened, she'll probably have no pleasure. If the clitoris has been re removed, clitoridectomy, she's not going to have any nice sensations. Okay? And if her labia have been cut and sealed together, then sex might even be painful. It might even tear her as she's having intercourse. Okay? So it's important to remember that joys and pleasures of sex are really important. Sadly, in the West, we've gone down the route of pathologizing sex. Oh, how many teenage pregnancies? How many sexual infections? We like counting the numbers. And what we've forgotten is this side of it. And especially without guilt and regret. Because how many people might have been taught as little children, oh, you shouldn't do that, that's dirty, that's wrong, that's naughty. And then if you do it, you think, oh, I feel guilty about this now. Guilt is a useless emotion. Just leave it. It's a useless emotion. Okay? Right. We're coming right towards the end. We've got ten minutes. Now, this is the important bit for all of you. What difference can you make? So think about all that you've done so far with your clients and think, right, but next time I go out to meet a client, I want to make a different difference. Okay? So what difference can you make? So you need to start off by asking yourselves, are there any things you would find difficult? So if a person started telling you about maybe their sex lives and what they're doing, are there particular things, maybe situations or activities, you would find hard to hear? Okay? Because it's really important. We're all called to be reflective practitioners. So we must reflect. And think, right, I would find that difficult. So if you do, that's absolutely fine. But what you must do is work on it yourself. Because that's not your patient's issue your client's issue, it's yours. Sadly, the live recording stopped in class, so I'm doing a voiceover at some point later. So the next thing that you need to do is, once you've identified particular issues around sexual health, especially in learning that you've had from clinical practice, then it's really important to feed this back to your teachers, to your education providers, so that they can look at ways of implementing this throughout your curriculum. Another key aspect of the difference that you can make is to check out your own national code of conduct for nursing and midwifery. I'm just showing you the very first opening sentences of the UK code of professional practice and right at the beginning it talks about prioritising people and every single line of this 
Um, if you interpret it from a point of view of sexual health and well-being, then certainly you can see ways of promoting health and well-being, of looking at prevention strategies, of challenging stigmas, and especially when you come across those stigmas in particular practice areas. A very practical way that you can talk about sex, uh, especially from the point of view of what difference you can make, is something called the explicit model. And you'll find that I've made reference to this um, on the main pages uh, for this video program. So the explicit um, was developed by Taylor and Davis, building on something called the Plicit model by J. A. Non from the 1980s. The central focus of this, you'll see the Plicit, which is permission giving, limited information, specific suggestions, and then referring on to others for what's called here intensive therapy. That's focusing on the client themselves, whereas the outside of the circle is focusing on you as the reflective practitioner. It encourages you to reflect, to audit how the sessions are going, uh, to boost your knowledge, to challenge assumptions, whether those assumptions are coming from the client or from yourselves. So I'd recommend you reading the article that's, that's shown here and it'll give you a really practical way of um, implementing the explicit model in everything you say and do with your clients. Finally, I'd say there are three more things you can do uh, to, to make sure that you are making a difference. And these three are summarised on the slide here. First of all, to normalise sexual health, then your impact on education, and seeing how that works within your clinical practice. So for normalising sexual health, look at ways of destigmatizing it or making sure that um, sex and sexual health are part of the... the um, conversations you have with multi-professional teams. Don't just keep it within your own pro uh, profession. And also look at building networks with others, especially with organisations that work around aspects of client care in relation to sexual health. In regards to your education providers, you need to tell your teachers that you want more of this. So especially when you're learning things in practice and then you need to reflect on them and bring them back to your universities, make sure you tell your university providers. You might also want to look out for different types of student placements that are available to you, uh, different types of opportunities, especially in your, your local area or maybe even further afield where you can go and work in different types of uh, sexual health uh, placements and make sure that sexual health is really put onto the curriculum for whichever programme you're studying. In relation to clinical practice, look at the ways in which you can start addressing this holistically. Think of the explicit model and make sure that you, sh you say to your mentors that you want to find out more about the sexual dimensions of the type of care that you're giving. Um, always make sure that uh, you can access different types of learning whenever you think this is appropriate. That's it. Here's the end of this presentation. Thank you all so much for listening. I'm sorry that the video ended as abruptly as it did, but hope that this voiceover at the end um, has helped you to catch up with those final few slides. I wish you every success in implementing sexual health uh, with the clients that you work with, both now and in your future. Thanks so much. Bye bye.